there's a Neil Gaiman novel called American Gods in which the, the, the deities are these superhuman beings that gradually emerge from the imagination of society and they feed on human belief and gradually they acquire the power to influence events in the real world. So today I want to talk to you about an idea from evolutionary biology that something a bit like this might be going on in our everyday lives. I'm not talking about a supernatural process. I'm talking about something that's commonplace, even ubiquitous in evolution. It's just not very easy to recognize when it's happening to you. So to clarify this, let's talk about what it means to be an individual. We tend to think of ourselves as fundamentally discrete, unique, well-defined beings. I mean, the idea of individual rights and responsibilities is pretty much the foundation of Western democracy. But is that perception accurate? When you look closely, there are all sorts of problems with the idea. We share thoughts, ideas, and beliefs with other people. Is the future you still you? If we replace part of your brain, are you still you? What if we replace your whole brain? What if we make copies of you? When we're confronted with this sort of confusion, we tend to resort to a sort of biological intuition, a, a common sense definition of an individual as something with a unique body and a unique genome. But it turns out this just leads to more problems. So finally, we can move to talking about an individual from a purely evolutionary Darwinian perspective in which case we define it as an entity that's bound together by, by some sort of shared fitness. And at last we have a definition that's consistent in the sense that we can apply it to genes and groups of cells and maybe even at higher levels. But it also creates one big caveat, which is that we can no longer treat individuality as a binary variable. We have to think of it as a continuum, something that emerges by degrees and can be found in all sorts of partially formed states in nature. So for example, you probably think of a dandelion as this itty bitty plant that's about six inches across. But dandelions have a special way of reproducing. Their flowers make seeds which are genetically identical to the parent plant and those seeds get distributed all around the parent. So when you look at a field of dandelions, you're actually looking at a field of clones. Or in evolutionary terms, you're looking at a single individual. In effect, a dandelion field is actually one very large tree that just doesn't happen to have a root system or a trunk. It's the same with animals. There are many species like corals, jellyfish, and aphids that alternate between clonal, sexual, and even colonial forms where the same genome can be located in many bodies, and many bodies can unify into one and then fragment again. This, this, for instance, is a diagram of the coral life cycle, and without going into details, you can see that it's actually really hard to define where an individual begins or ends. At the same time, different genomes can become inextricably entwined. The most dramatic example of this is endosymbiosis, where cells incorporate other cells and ultimately assimilate them so that they can no longer survive or reproduce outside the other cell. This is how plants turn sunlight into sugar and also how plants and animals turn sugar into energy. So it's an absolutely fundamental process to most of what we see going on around us in life. But there are also much more dynamic interactions and relationships between genomes. For instance, your gut fauna comprise 90% of the cells in your body and have 99% of the genes. How does your relationship with them work? Are they part of you or part of something else? So from all this complexity, how can we extract some sense of identity? The traditional approach in evolutionary biology is kin selection where we use this relationship called Hamilton's rule, RB greater than C. Um, so if you're, if you're related, if the product of our relatedness and the benefit to you exceeds the cost to me, then I ought to behave altruistically toward you. In practice, this isn't actually so simple. 
relatedness is relative to the rest of the population, and it can be off offset by competition. Often the people you, you have most opportunity to help are also the people that you're competing with most directly. And really, you should also be helping things that help you, regardless of, whether you're, of how related they are to you. So an approach that deals with this complexity of clonal evolution and symbioses is multi-level selection theory. That is, the units of selection, genes, cells, or organisms, tend to aggregate in groups and re reproduce as a unit. This in turn creates higher level units, which can be under selection in different directions. It's this continuous interleaving of competition and cooperation at different scales in evolution. Often these groups will themselves consist of related units, like bacterial colonies or, or the cells in most of your organs, but they can also be unrelated, like your gut fauna. So this is, in, in a sense, a much broader approach than kin selection. How important it is generally is still very controversial within biology. But I am going to talk about some research that suggests it may be very important for human biology in particular. So how do these collective entities emerge that consist of animals with different genomes? In most cases, we think it starts with kin selection, because often one of the best things that you can do evolutionarily is to help your offspring, like that sparrow in the corner. But sometimes you might not have the opportunity to breed for yourself. For instance, if you don't have the resources to build your own home. So in this case, the best way to improve your fitness might be to stay home, delay breeding, and instead help your parents to raise your siblings. So when housing is too expensive or no jobs are available, you don't try to get married. In fact, you don't mature at all. You live in your parents' basement indefinitely. Um, but what if there are never enough resources to breed independently? In that case, you might as well just dedicate your whole physiology to helping your parents. And when this happens consistently enough, you can get the emergence of a superorganism where many of the offspring remain sterile for their entire lives. Now, this is actually a fantastic situation from an evolutionary perspective, because it means that you can create division of labor. You can have some individuals who specialize in foraging, others who build air-conditioned fortresses or work on farms, and others who form armies to defend your cities and attack your rivals. It's an extraordinarily successful way of life. So much so that it can be maintained even if the original relatedness that started it is lost. This is something that we see in ant colonies, where eusociality seems to start with a monogamous queen, um, which means that everyone in the nest is closely related. But later on in evolution, the queens might have multiple mates, or there might even be multiple queens in the same colony. And the best example of this is the Argentine ant, which has created cooperative super colonies across several continents. But when you have this decline in relatedness, you also have a, uh, an incentive to cheat. For example, sometimes worker ants will try to lay eggs of their own to be raised in shared nurseries. And these cheat che cheating queens will grow up to start new colonies that are more closely related to the, to, to the cheating worker. So evolutionarily speaking, this is a profitable cheating strategy. The same sort of thing happens within our own bodies at the cellular level. We have a division of, of labor among cell lineages that form different organs. Virtually all of these lineages are doomed. After about 50 divisions, they will lose the ability to divide. But as they're dividing, they can also evolve by natural selection, especially through changes to epigenetic markers, which switch different parts of the genome on and off. So cell lineages in your body are under selection to survive and breed faster than other cell lineages. If they succeed, you'll get cancer. Mostly, of course, these cancers are themselves doomed because they kill their hosts. But there have been a couple of cases 
where cancers manage to escape and survive in the outside world. One is Tasmanian devils, where an infectious cancer has wiped out about 70% of the population since the early 1990s. Another example is a venereal cancer of dogs that survived for about 11,000 years, whilst your average dog is lucky to make it to 15. So it's not the most dignified form of immortality you can imagine, but it's something. So maintaining cooperation is an eternal problem for collectives. Even when they are basically genetically identical, there's selection to rebel. And the problem becomes worse if we're talking about diverse individuals to begin with. It seems that one of the universal solutions to this is policing. We punish cheats. For example, worker ants will often brutally attack other workers when they catch them trying to lay eggs and they will tear their limbs off. This punishment creates another problem. If you have police who have special powers, they can be corrupted. And in fact, in some ant species, the, 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 the individuals who cheat are consistently the police officers. So one way, to, one way you can escape this corruption problem by a game theory models is how we know about this stuff. Um, one way you can escape this is if everyone evolves to be a police officer. Um, and in that case, the cheats get caught very quickly and cheating disappears. So this seems to be the solution that honeybees and perhaps our cells have, have hit upon and perhaps it's something that happens in human society as well. So at last we can ta start to talk about human cooperation and social behaviour. At some point in our evolutionary history, we went through a very dramatic social transition. Ape societies are generally hierarchical, but human hunter-gatherers are consistently quite egalitarian. They share food, they make decisions collectively, and they, they, they really don't like arrogant and boastful people. So how did we make this transition from, from the very a, 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 aggressive linear hierarchies of apes to human egalitarianism? We don't really know, but many researchers think it's an adaptation to competition between tribes. So groups of male chimps will sometimes get together to raid other groups in a sort of simple warfare. And the argument is that in human evolutionary history, smarter individuals were better at social manipulation, promoting alliance formation and their collective fitness. Non-hierarchical alliances are inherently less wasteful for the group because there's no squabbling over who comes first. So when tribes compete, the ones with large egalitarian coalitions and strong cooperative social norms will tend to win. Looking at human psychological studies, we can see a lot of stuff that seems to fit with this view of humans as a species that's adapted to group level competition and social coordination. We fit in very willingly with the social norms and expectations of a, a group, regardless of our personal morality. Um, in the Stanford prison experiment that was conducted right here, for example, students were given the roles of prisoners and guards, which they played with such enthusiasm that the experiment had to be called off after six days because the prisoners were being violently abused. I don't think so. I don't think any ethics committees so would. Um, <laughs> he says that's in the law. It could be, but I think we have some um, evidence from other uh, other areas that that we can get humans to behave similarly. One, for instance, was the the Milgram experiments, where um, they 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 got one student um, to play a victim and another student to give them electric shocks. And um, the outcome was that most, mo most of the, um, the, the, the ones giving the shocks would do it until it appeared that the, the, the victim was dead. Unconscious. Unconscious, yes. 
although I think they had a big red X on the dial or something, so it was very ambiguous, but <laughs> definitely sinister. Um, so there, there, there are countless studies that, that show people tend to favour their own group above other groups. Um, there was one study where people were just randomly given small coloured tokens and then they were, they were told that this was random and they were also told that it would have absolutely no impact on anything. And then, then they immediately started to treat the, the people who had the same coloured token much more favourably than anyone else. The participants, yeah. I don't know about the experimenters. I don't think they had tokens. <laughs> um, there's even some evidence that this in-group favoritism is driven by um, oxytocin, which is the, 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 the famous hormone of love and trust. Apparently, it only increases love and trust within groups, and it actually makes you more likely to discriminate against other groups. Um, and of course, another issue is another sort of adaptation to living in groups is our propensity to cheat. And, and, and we, it seems we have dedicated cognitive architecture to deal with this possibility. We like to punish cheats and we like it when other people punish cheats. We're better at reasoning when we frame a, a, a logic problem in terms of how can I detect this cheat? And we're also corruptible. When you make people feel empowered, they become more punitive towards others who violate social norms, and at the same time, less likely to adhere to those norms themselves. So all in all, we, 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 it seems we have a ton of evolved cognitive architecture to help us live in groups and subtly manipulate things to our own advantage within these groups. Now, in modern day life, we've seen human collectives emerge that can survive far beyond the lifetime of an individual. And they, sex, they, they, they satisfy the general requirements for being under natural selection. This was first noticed by Milton Friedman in reference to firms. New firms arise, they copy one another's successful business strategies, some grow and spread, and others go out of business as they compete. So this is, this is one of the foundations of the field of evolutionary economics. And if you believe in the free market, this could be a very beautiful thing because firms are supposed to be evolving just to make stuff that people are willing to buy. And people are, of course, completely rational free agents. Unfortunately, the real picture is not so simple. The evolutionary argument doesn't apply just to firms. It also applies to all human organisations whether they're government-driven, religious, or non-profit. They all compete for survival and proliferation, and they all adopt successful strategies that they've seen in others. And this competition isn't necessarily about satisfying a perfectly rational consumer. It's about exploiting human nature. Human nature comes with all this pre-evolved cognitive architecture for group life, a host of cognitive biases, a tendency to anthropomorphism, a craving for social status, loyalty and aggression towards anyone we perceive to be violating social norms. That's a fantastic pile of material for selection to work with, on the level, all on the level of collectives. So one of the things that organisations can do is they can accrue power. By power I mean both money and less tangible forms of influence. The sort of influence that means your interests are principal concern when world-shaping decisions get made. We tend to have a, a slightly naive view of power within an organisation as something like a, this pyramid or Christmas tree. Most people don't have much, but there's a hierarchy of managers and bosses who have some sort of influence, the powerful people, and then if you're really lucky you get to be the star at the top of the Christmas tree, the king, and the king does whatever he wants. In real life, kings are not free agents. Their choices are extremely constrained. They spend most of their time trying to maintain and expand the systems that got them into power in the first place. 
so in a sense, the whole organ organization is acting as a self-perpetuating cycle under natural selection. And power is occurring within the cycle, away from the individuals who, who comprise it, including the kings. So one of the most famous biologists of our time, E.O. Wilson, has argued that human so sociality of this sort means we should actually consider ourselves to be superorganisms. Most biologists don't really agree with this because superorganisms usually consist of a small number of parents and a lot of sterile workers, which is not how we roll. However, I think there is a strong argument that human collectives need to be considered as operating as evolutionary entities in their own right, which makes them a sort of biological individual. And this selection is in some ways perhaps more powerful than the selection that drives the formation of normal biological superorganisms. Because superorganisms usually reproduce very slowly compared with the, the, the organisms that comprise them, which places very strong limits on the pace of their evolution. Because humans aren't tied for a lifetime to one collective, our collectives can evolve extremely rapidly, more rapidly than we can. Collectives can achieve amazing things precisely because they concentrate power so effectively at a level beyond the individual. No human could ever create the pyramids of Giza. But rapidly evolving collectives that accrue power are not necessarily always acting in our best interests. What happens when there's a conflict of interest between human individuals and the collectives that comprise them? It seems human interests often get overridden. And whilst we might like to demonise individuals for justifying the, the, the selfishness of, of, of the collectives they work for, we tend to forget that the collective itself is explicitly set up and constantly evolving to favour such selfishness. I'm, glass, I'm guessing your final quote there was it from the last week or two, not something you've been using for a long time. <laughs> yes. <laughs> The, the history of the cigarette is a vivid illustration of how collective interests aren't necessarily good for humanity. As early as the 1940s, a medical consensus had emerged that smoking causes lung cancer. The tobacco industry worked together. They recognised this, this threat in the early 1950s, and they figured out numerous ways to undermine this consensus. They developed public relations tactics to engineer consent, Whilst casting doubt on research findings, they set up their own research funding bodies under the guise of taking responsibility for their product and then redirected the research to avoid any problematic findings. And at the same time, they developed a huge network of media, political and scientific contacts. All this strategic work paid off greatly, such that cigarette sales rose substantially over the following decade. Today, cigarettes still kill one and a half million people every year. There's no single human individual responsible for this disaster. It's the product of a collective interest that quite directly opposes human well-being and has the power to motivate numerous individuals to each play a small part in maintaining it. <laughs> I'm not sure the cancers actually profit directly, but you never know. Maybe one of them will escape. So why am I telling a bunch of computer scientists about this? It's because of how machine learning might play into this sort of dystopian collective dynamic. First off, big data gives collectives unprecedented opportunities to understand and manipulate humans. Companies that deliver news feeds are in a position of extraordinary power. It's not just about controlling the information that you see, but about externally regulating your emotions and choices. For instance, there was a rather disturbing study recently where Facebook demonstrated that they could directly change people's moods just by manipulating what they saw in their feed, the proportion of positive content. You can foster loyalties and promote social norms that benefit the collective using tokens and punishments. 
You can reward people with status symbols that don't actually enhance their well-being. And you can predict everything from stock market prices to epidemics using social media chatter, all for your own profit. Lastly, you can set up your system so that the system never actually gets the blame for any problems and establish and maintain relationships with other collectives that buffer you against human influence. So all of these manipulations contribute to diverting power from individuals to collectives. Here's a purely hypothetical example of how data analysis equals power. There were two studies from Facebook. In one case, Facebook report reported that they could quite reliably predict people's political affiliations from their likes. This isn't surprising at all. After all, lots of things correlate with likes very nicely. A while later, they reported that they could increase voter turnout by showing people whether their friends had voted. And this was hailed as a wonderful thing for democracy. After all, who doesn't want to increase voter turnout? But when you take... <laughs> Um, when you take these two results together, obviously it would be quite trivial to use this information to manipulate election outcomes by showing the voter, voter button to people who you want to vote. And what's worse is that the feed algorithm is completely opaque. We have absolutely no way of knowing if any company is doing anything like this. A second disturbing aspect of this is that machine learning is becoming ubiquitous and outperforming hum humans in both data analysis and more creative pursuits. There are a few very specialized, there, 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 there are very few specialized domains where humans still outperform computers. And this means that wherever possible, human collectives should prefer to shift decision making away from humans and towards machines, which of course we can expect to greatly enhance the progressive disempowerment of humans. Machine learning algorithms are brilliant, but they are usually very specialized. They're generally not endowed with moral intuitions, and more importantly, they don't look at things in the context of broad human values. They don't ask themselves, how will my decision affect humanity generally, given everything that I can possibly know about the world? This is a phenomenon sometimes referred to as artificial stupidity. When people talk about artificial intelligence as a threat to humanity, they're usually dismissed because, well, why would an AI want to hurt us? I think if we consider collectives as beings with semi-independent interests from ours that evolve in their own right, we can understand the likely motivations of AIs much more explicitly, at least the kind of AIs that we are going to create as a species. And whilst these motives are not intrinsically hostile to humanity, they're also not inherently friendly. Their ultimate motive is to accrue power, and the ways in which we let them do this are crucial to how we should expect them to evolve. So to sum up all of this, I've argued that there's a, a meaningful analogy between evolving collective entities in nature and collective human organizations. And I've suggested that this results in some concerning trends, especially in terms of progressive disempowerment of, ind of human individuals versus the collective entities that we've created. This is primarily a verbal argument as yet. It's based on some mathematical models from evolutionary biology, whose assumptions and conclusions don't necessarily extend to human collectives. But if it is correct to any degree, then perhaps it's time we stopped fighting about whether government or corporations are more evil, except that they both naturally, oppose, naturally evolve to, at times, oppose human interests and start looking for ways to make them evolve into something better for humans. Thank you. So, um, questions? This is very much a tangent, but I was intrigued by your dog cancer that had lived 90,000 years or something. 11,000 years, 11, yeah. How does one quantify 
How does one know that? And this is these same organisms, the same cells, presumably have been. Yes, yeah, so, so, so the, it, it's a cell lineage from the original dog, um, and, and, and they can measure that by um, changes in n neutral DNA. So DNA that doesn't actually code for anything, but evolves with a sort of semi regular pace. Based on the uh, rate at which the cells uh, mutate or Yeah, something. yeah. Yep. So where does a pack of wolves fit in on the scale? Um, I think that depends on who you ask. Um, so wolves, have, wolves generally have a dominant pair, a dominant mating pair, and that's the only one that, 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 these are the only wolves that breed within a pack. And then you have um, a, a, a group of younger individuals who are not ready to establish their own pack and they contribute to hunting and um, sometimes, so, so occasionally they will manage to breed a bit. Um, but generally it's only the monogamous dominant pair that will breed, so. Eo yeah, Wilson would probably, I guess, say that they're a little bit on the road to eusociality and most people would say, no, that's just kin selection. Does that make sense? Yep. So I'm bringing up the analogy of fire. You know, it can do great harm and it can do great good. Mm. So when you think about human collectives, are you thinking that it's dangerous to have larger human collectives? Supposing bodies like the UN and so on. I mean, is it better not to do it because the, the potential for danger is so great? That's a, that's a really interesting question, and I, I honestly don't know. I I wouldn't automatically say that large collectives are a bad thing. I think we we really don't know much about how collectives evolve because we we don't think of organisations as evolving in in any independent sense. Um, and, and everything we've achieved as a species has, has, has come about because of our ability to form collectives as well. So there's, there, there, there's great power and great danger, as you say, like fire. So if you think about the emergence of the internet, just walking into this building, the birth of the internet, mm -hmm. I mean, the internet is definitely a basis for potentially creating a super organism or a global scale human collective. Yes. Um, what do you have a point of view about things we can do to make sure it's people-centered? Um, I have some, some ideas. I don't know that I would go so far as to say I have a viewpoint because um, I, th I think this is something that needs a lot of research. Um, it seems to me that... Um, if we can um, de de destabilize the, the relationship networks that collectives establish among themselves, that might that, that, that might help because political lobbying by collectives obviously provides them with a lot of extra clout in terms of the the, the fate of humanity. Um, I think um, there are, that, that there's potential for organisations, for, for people within organisations to work to, to, to restructure them, um, to increase transparency and um, change the goals of the organisations to align better with human interests. So, um, a, a, a search engine, say, has an intrinsic interest that to some extent aligns with human, well, human well-being. Everyone wants better search and they want their search to be objective. But there are, of course, potential situations where, 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 where that ceases to be true. So um, the, 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 the more you can channel the collective interest of your organisation away from that those sorts of moral dilemmas, the better, I guess. 
One of your slides seemed to be saying that power inherently corrupts people or power breeds hypocrisy or mm. power has a bad effect on the people that become yeah. powerful. Um, presumably there are some people of power who remain altruistic more so than others. To what extent can you separate that the power is causing something versus the, the latent hypocrite is looking for a way to exploit his power or somebody is already corrupted is trying to look for a way to take advantage of the situation? There have been um, a couple of studies that tried to look at that. Um, so usually the way they do this is they prime people to feel powerful by, by presenting them with scenarios and then, um, and, and, and then give them some sort of moral dilemma. Um, in, in some studies, the, 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 I think there was one study that suggested that in fact empowering people didn't um, change their initial moral predisposition. Um, but I think later on the same researchers went back and, 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 and did a more long-term study <coughs> and they found that actually over time people became corrupt even if they weren't initially. So it, it, just, it just took longer. But I could be misrepresenting the literature. I would need to check that. Yes. So you mentioned cheating several times. Mm. And there's been a lot of work recently with uh, fMRI to find regions in the brain. Uh, has anybody found the region associated with cheating? Not that I'm they aware of. Have they looked for it? No? Um, I don't know. I don't know about that. Um, there, there, there were argument. There have been arguments since the 1990s that we have some sort of dedicated brain circuitry for cheetah detection, but I'm not aware of any neurological evidence that supports that. My question was: um, How did you build this list? What what did you resource, and what sort of inner thinking? And also uh, uh, noticing that it, in many ways, seems to mirror some of the things that are going on with holacracies and other ways of creating flat organizations, etc. So there is a mirror of this out in society, I would say. So how did you produce this? I, 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 I can't say I have any formal process for that. Um, it, it, it's, it, it's, it's a list of ideas that, 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 that occurred to me when I was... But when I've been, I mean, I've been trying to think about possible solutions to this, that's all. So I'm sure I'm just getting it out of popular culture. And yes. Oh, thank you. <laughs> I, I'm still intrigued by the cheating, or by the, uh, the power and corruption and hypocrisy thing. Mm -hmm. um, presumably, uh, an organism would have to have a certain level of understanding of the world before its behavior could be changed in one direction or another. <clears throat> I think of insects, for instance, being hardwired. Would a, in a bee colony, does the queen try to exploit her power in the situation, or do you have to have some self-awareness and, and ability to analyze the world to figure out if there's a situation you could take advantage of? You don't need self-awareness. Um, so, in, 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 in quite a lot of species, the queen will manipulate the, the sex ratio of her offspring, for instance, and this, this may or may not be in the interests of the uh, of the workers, they will try to manipulate it back, and and, and you get this power dynamic. Um, the the way it works is that um, the, the 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 queen will will secrete pheromones and then use chemical signalling to, to 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 influence the behaviour of other individuals, um, and then the workers will do, will do the same thing in reverse. So it, 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 it's a self-organizing process. It doesn't need to be conscious at all. Which one is cheating? Um. I don't know who's cheating <laughs> in that situation. They're, di they're different. There's, they, they are in something you can call a group. They're also in diff two different other groups. So I don't know who's cheating. Who's, who, mm. who is cheating? You're saying the queen well, is cheating or the workers are cheating? I don't think it, 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 Everybody is trying to cheat the collective entity, I guess. Well, and I suppose. three collective entities. Yeah. Well, so three. which one is being <laughs> <laughs> um, So, 
we can think of the interests of the hive, the interests of the queen, and the interests of the workers. Um, so if you assume that, 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 that the goal of the nest is to be cooperative, um, <laughs> well, from, from, from the point of view of the, of the superorganism argument, to the extent that they represent a, a, a single individual, they should be trying to cooperate to reproduce as a, as a whole nest. But they're not a single superorganism. There's three superorganisms. Uh, a, 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 a nest of eusocial insects is is a single superorganism. It's, 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 a lot, it's a lot of different organisms, but it's a single superorganism. There's multiple superorganisms. So just because <laughs> one happens to be the biggest, why is it the only one whose goal should be pushed? <coughs> well, that, that's kind of the, um, the question of this whole talk. I mean, <laughs> should, should, should we be submitting to the interests of our collectives because they're bigger than us? Uh, well, we know the answer uh, to that. It's from the point of view of individual ants or, or, or bees, it's the same dilemma. Yeah. They just have a stronger interest in supporting the collective. And among these bees where the queen is trying to manipulate things for her own benefit, mm -hmm. is that universal among bees or bees of a particular breed or are um, there benevolent bee queen? queen? So it, it, there's a lot of variation in, in social systems between different species. Um, Honey bees, for instance, are, are pretty much um, consistent cooperators. They, they don't. They don't really cheat much. Um, whereas, in in some species of ants, the the, the workers will um, get, do, do all sorts of manipulations to, to, to try to ch change things in their own interests. I guess what I'm thinking is getting back to the question of to what extent is this behavior learned or acquired over time versus hardwired within the organism? You know, if if, if bees of a certain species. If some hives are benevolent and others are manipulative, that would suggest, I don't know what that would um, suggest. I'm just intrigued by the idea. So <laughs> within species, usually the, the, the behavior will be, will be consistent. You won't see much difference between individual nests. So that implies maybe that the queen is becoming corrupted with power, or maybe the queen is hardwired to try to stress some aspect of the dynamics that comes to play, depending on how it, the other genders mature. Yeah, it's, it, it's all pretty much hardwired. Um, they can have some response to environmental cues where they change their, their, their behaviour pattern, but, but they're not really capable of thinking about their situation and saying, hey, I could advantage myself by doing this. Yeah. Is there any evidence of punishment of cheaters within the social insects? Um, yes. Okay. So there, there are um, these ants, for instance, where um, occasionally a worker will develop ovaries, which means she's going to lay eggs. And when the when the other ants see this, kind of cheating, I grant you. <laughs> uh, I was thinking uh, more shirking. Ah, shirking. Um, it isn't really in their interest to shirk. Generally, I, I think. Even without such punishment, but. Um. <laughs> yes. Well. <laughs> that's that, that's the question. Yeah, but if the grasshopper has a good violin, that could make everybody happy and be good for the community. And what about those dandelions? They're really asexual reproduction, a genetic copies at each level, and no, no pollen exchange in order to uh, create the, the flowering well, they, seeds? They kind of use their own pollen, so they're, they're, they're making seeds, but the seeds are genetically identical to the parent. So, but if the wind happens to be good that day, they get pollen mixed up from their neighbor? I, 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 I'm, I'm not sure how that works, actually. I, I, I think that they're also capable of sexual reproduction sometimes, but um, most of the time they're, they're just finding themselves. The dandelions and the bees cooperate in order to uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, one little click of who I'm going to pollinate with who. Well, yeah, actually, that's, that's, that's kind of what happens with a lot of um, in insect-plant relationships. Um, uh, the, 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 there'll be specialization with different hosts and different kinds of flowers and spe new species arising because of that. Chaos, <laughs> yes. I, I want to um, uh, point out that I think the word corruption is a, a loaded term mm. um, because I, I come from the Chinese culture and when the um, one dynasty would be taken over by the next one, they called it the passing of the mandate of heaven. 
that uh -huh. the um, what was the attack and the revolution then became the received wisdom until it lost its thing. And so that I feel that it's part of the survival of the species that we don't actually always continue, that we need what you're calling corruption or seeking advantage on an individual level in order to renew mm. as well. So I, yes, I, 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 I'm just calling into question that the word corruption really buys into the status quo. Yes, it does, yeah. Um, the, this question of how much we should be policing things versus um, fostering diversity, I think, is really um, complex. Um, there were there was this. Um, so I, I wrote an article talking about this this policing issue for a, for a magazine a while ago, um, and what, what, one of the issues in it was, you know, could we create universal policing in in, in humans, and if we did. What would happen? What, what what would happen to creativity and um, and 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 to to our collective evolution? Would it be a good thing or a bad thing? And a lot of people were very um, upset by this. <laughs> um, just last week, there was this app, People, that came out. Um, or I'm not sure if it's actually out yet, but. Um, the, the idea is that you write, you, 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 you review other people, and uh, that's, I, th I, I think everyone immediately saw that that would be an absolutely horrible thing to do. No, it's a horrible <laughs> thing to write down, because we do it. <laughs> <laughs> it happens on Wikipedia today. And then you have police yeah. and levels of police. And, uh, mm. uh, and now that we've killed police. corruption, <laughs> <laughs> that we've said it's not perhaps a lot about. The different beehives, so there are different levels of what you call cheating. Mm -hmm. Those or, those superorganisms, at some point, the queen cheating gave them some advantage over some other hive that didn't queen cheat. And in some other situation, the worker cheating gave them some advantage. So they ended. So we're seeing the result of the success of what mm -hmm. of the cheating, and the different species were at different situations they went through. Yeah. So cheating helps. Cheating yeah. hurts. I think the biggest yeah. example of cheating is the United States of America and the actual American Revolution. Yeah. <laughs> um, w w w would you elaborate on that? <laughs> so, so if we had if we had thought it was corrupt not to pay taxes and to do the Boston Tea Party mm. and, and so on, and to bring up this new idea that one man, one vote, and that people should have, be able to have town councils and decide how their community could work. That was not possible in Europe or in Asia. It was only possible because of the open territory and the richness mm. of the land that allowed enough people to come and organize. Um, the, it, it, it was touch and go whether the 13 colonies would agree to this. But to me, in the way you use the term corruption, the, Amer the, the founding of the American Republic was a, the greatest example of corruption. That, I think that's a really good point, yeah. And, and, and you can also sort of see the, the, the emergence of competing coalitions in that because you, you can't have a revolution by yourself. Um, you, have, you have to form your own collective and fight, fight for what you value. But the meme of the American Constitution has been copied and modified and used around the world. The mandate of heaven yep. moves, right? <laughs> <laughs> so the words become important. Authors authors are spreaders of memes. Very yeah. important. Mm -hmm. Cool. Yes. Yeah. So you discussed um, a little bit about machine learning agents that mm -hmm. are good at some very specific task mm -hmm. and um, implied that if they were to self-organize, and this could be very poor for uh, human interests. And that seems to make sense, um, but I think that we are lacking the whole genetic algorithm to get them to globally optimize with each other. And if we consider that we don't have that, how might such a system work? It's like you have Ocean's Eleven, and you're trying to pull a heist on humanity, but there's no George Clooney. 
So like what? <laughs> what was that one? Do you, <laughs> do you have any ideas? <laughs> <laughs> do you have any ideas about um, how we might expect um, a pseudo biological system or mechanical system to uh, develop deceit, cheating, and such, and organize into a collective? Um, so I, I'm not I'm not really suggesting that any particular AI is going to take on this sort of um, sentient, de de demonic in individualism. I think what, what's much more likely is that you have an algorithm that's just doing what algorithms do every day in our lives, optimizing some, some function, um, it, it, so, so, some, so something to do with its share price, something to do with ma manipulating uh, an, an economic situation, and it's it's completely ignorant of the human consequences of its actions or of how that will play out globally. Sorry? Malice by ignorance. Yes, exactly. Okay. We're done.